Maybe I'm up too high. Anyway, let me, um, first, you can hear me, right, Chelsea? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. I have a, uh, a couple of stories to tell you here. This is about securing clients' personal information. It's all at the expense of Title I. Um, and, and so I'll tell you a couple of mistakes that we've seen made and um, that could help you as an agent be able to maybe um, not get into the same uh, problems that not only we got in, but some of the other agents uh, found themselves in the middle of. So the first, I'm just gonna start with what I'll call a case study. It's really just a, a terrible experience. Um, in October, 2017, We'd heard a little bit about wire fraud and um, thought that maybe we were too good to get hit by it, but uh, we had a, um, a client that um, had, their, had their property in the name of a trust and um, the real estate agent in the transaction, we'll just call him John, represented the seller. And the seller was netting about $67,000. So not a lot of money on the sale of her home. John, the real estate agent liked all the communication to be uh, straight through him. Maybe he was a little bit of a control freak and uh, John used Gmail as, prefer as his preferred email provider, mostly because it was free. Um, John was unaware that he'd clicked on an email and we found this out afterwards. We did some forensics on his computer to try to figure out how this had all gone down, but he clicked on an email on his computer and it was infected with a virus that supplied a password, password information to an unknown person somewhere in China and um, including, but not limited to his Gmail account password. So uh, John, the real estate agent had been targeted because he was a real estate agent. Um, this uh, person in China logged into John's Gmail account and waited to see what John had to say. Um, they patiently watched probably for a couple of months, maybe longer. And, um, and uh, the communication between John and his client with the title company prior to the morning of funding was, uh, was all that they were waiting for. Uh, eventually, um, uh, this, uh, this fraudster, I'll call him, in um, China embedded in the chain of emails between John and the escrow officer, an email letting her know that the seller decided to send the proceeds to a different account than what they'd set, that they just set up that morning, which is unusual. That's not a normal practice, right? But the account name that was, um, um, the account was in the name of the trust of, of the seller and it was with Chase Bank. Both seemed pretty reputable. So in spite of the fact that Title I had a uh, policy and procedure in place that said the escrow officer was not able to accept any verbal communication and had to confirm with the seller if the wire instructions changed. The escrow officer promptly wired funds to Chase Bank after the recording. And it seemed like no problems had occurred. Everything was fine, but um, the seller left town for a couple of weeks and that's why there was no problem. When she returned, she called the title company, called Title One and said, hey, why don't I have my 67,000 in my account? Uh, we were unable to get any information from Chase Bank for two weeks because they, we didn't have authorization. That's a, that's a big problem. And the FBI finally confirmed the account was cleaned out and closed really the day following uh, the deposit in there. So a couple of questions, and this is where I need some feedback. I know this is a, um, a uh, virtual class, so it's not as accommodating conversation, but... Um, Who's, who's responsible for the loss? Just, just who do you think is uh, ultimately responsible? Is it the seller? Don't be shy, somebody speak up. Would your seller be responsible to pay those funds? I mean, to, to just suffer that loss? They had given us the wire instructions at closing. No, the title company, I think the title company- I can't hear.
Pauline? Yeah. Oh, I need, oh, there. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a title company that is, that is uh, liable because they're the ones that have the funds and they, they put it to the wrong place. And kind of to go even a little bit deeper, you know, it's the, and, and clearly the title company, Title I lost, I, I'll spare you the suspense, we lost $67,000, which is, you know, not earth shattering, but it's a lot of money just gone. Um, what about the ENO policy? You know, and, and, and if, if anybody has comments, just tell me your comments. I'll just kind of go through the scenarios here. Because we had policies and procedures in place not to accept wire instructions from the, um, the um, seller without confirming them, our e &O policy, uh, the loss on that was denied. Besides that, there's like a $30,000 deductible. So do you really want to pay it? And then they raise the premium. Um, cyber fraud policy. Um, again, policies and procedures weren't followed, so they denied it. So the title company is responsible. I just want to talk a little bit about, because your agents, um, what could have been done differently? Uh, title company followed. If the title company followed policies and procedures, maybe there's not a loss. Um, escrow should never accept changes to wire instructions through email. And, and we have um, put that, we don't accept. Sometimes people say, well, I just want to email my wire instructions. We will not accept those at all, no matter what. They've got to be in person. And I think I think that's a good policy. Um, emails absolutely can be compromised. Maybe the real estate agent gives up some of the control. I mean, why as a real estate agent, does he want to be providing the title company's wire instructions to his client? Um, do any of you do that? Or do you allow the title, is the title company the one that is um, providing the wire instructions? Personally, I let the title company take care of that. And I think that's the policy absolutely you ought to have. Um, we were a little more flexible and allowed John to give some of that information out. Um, and then two-factor authentication when logging into email. Um, I'm still surprised there's a lot of... Um, agents that are still not using two-factor authentication. Um, I think Gmail is a good platform, but it's, um, it's hacked a lot. And two-factor authentication just simply, I mean, I don't, I don't need you to raise your hands and say, hey, I don't use it. But it is something that I think you should um, write down if you're not using it. And if it's Gmail or if it's Hotmail, all of the major email providers, uh, Microsoft certainly, all provide two-factor authentication. And uh, what that does is if, if your email has been compromised and somebody's logging into it, you're going to get a passcode on your phone that says, you know, are you attempting to log in? If so, enter this passcode. You know that somebody's in your email. And, and I think if everyone did that just alone, wire fraud would uh, be reduced tremendously. But I still see agents that are not doing that. And I, I think principally that's because it's a pain. You know, it's a, um, sometimes you have to put a code in when you're getting in your email, but um, for sure I would, I would say absolutely ought to do that. So what are the barriers to implementing change? Not worth the cost to implement. Um, you know, we didn't, Title I didn't think it was that big of a deal. It was other title companies that were maybe uh, um, just flying by the seat of the pants or something. It wasn't us. We weren't going to get hit by it. But $67,000 gets my attention. And um, all of a sudden, we start to think, OK, we need to get serious about that. And so whether it costs you from a loss or it costs you from a uh, um, or, or if you're just smart enough to say, I want to avoid this kind of a problem. Um, 
either way, you need to get with it because there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of risk out there. It's not going away. It's getting worse all the time. So um, I guess I guess the other um, the other uh, thing that helps is email phishing. I oops, I haven't really been going through this, but let me um, let me click on it. Probably gone far ahead. Um, so let me go to a different one. I I think um, in December of 2020, you know, we had all these things in place. We were doing a split closing. We were splitting with um, First American Title. They were doing the buyer side of the transaction. And just so you know, this is continuing. Every week I hear about some kind of financial loss due to fraud. And um, we, we, again, we were, we were closing the seller, the seller agent, longtime client of ours. He's, um, he's feeling pretty safe. His buyers, they weren't his buyers. The other agent involved, his buyers were out of state. It was a first time home buyer deal. They were putting $15,000 down and um, they had done a mobile notary kind of closing in that package were wire instructions from um, First American Title that showed exactly where to send the wire instructions to uh, or the money to, where to wire the money to. And we had a, uh, a um, somewhere the morning that the funds were to be transferred, this email was sent. Let me just see if I can change it up here. Um, This email was sent. Can you see that? Isn't that not? I mean, Mary Ann's long term escrow officer. Somebody hacked either the agent or Mary Ann. I'm guessing it's probably the agent because First American has pretty good security. Hacked and sent out this nice email to uh, the buyer. And the buyer promptly went over to their bank and wired funds. Um, can you see anything wrong with that email? Anything that stands out? Yeah, it's not a real name. It's uh, escrowofficerclose at gmail.com. Exactly. So that should be a clue to your, to your buyer, right? Probably not. I mean, the buyer's not going to if they're really computer savvy, they would. Um, you know, the verbiage on that is maybe a little bit off. Yeah, they kindly they kindly proceed yeah. now and send a confirmation slip. Yeah, that's that's a little odd. What what about the fact that it says forwarded at the very top? Forwarded. I think that's forwarded to Taisha, our escrow officer. So oh, I don't okay. I don't think that was. Um, that's just sent yeah that's just sent to us we asked marianne for a copy of it just to see what in the world was looking at okay so i mean i can see how somebody's tricked by that but let me show you um can you see the wire instructions anything look odd about that The account name, maybe. Yeah. Krishan Carter. I, I mean, this is this is a title company in Salt Lake City. And they're wiring to Krishan Carter in Humble, Texas. Um, I, I think it's. You know, it, it's funny if you go back. I mean, I really don't understand how a buyer would look at that and say it's okay, other than they just don't know. They're not doing this, and so they don't know. What I like about um, Mary Ann's is it showed, oh, I thought it had the, it does, it's just cut off. 
it has her wire fraud warning on there too, which is almost humorous. But um, so so what happens on this? There's a um, there's a um, the buyer promptly goes and wires the fifteen thousand dollars, all the money they had in the world, to. Um, and, and I don't know where these guys were out of, but um, to somebody, 15,000, again, isn't a lot, but it was a lot to those buyers. And how did that impact the closing? The, um, the buyers couldn't buy the home and the sellers had already had, they had a home listed. They had it, um, I mean, they had a purchase already. They were closing the next day on their, um, on the purchase of their new home, that home was delayed as the as the buyers frantically went around trying to ask their relatives for fifteen thousand dollars. I'm not even sure if that's legal to go borrow your down payment from your family, but it um, in this case, about four weeks later, they came up with the money and everything went through. So it was a happy ending to it, but. Sometime in the interim there, the um, agent that was, was our client on the seller side called and said, what can we do on this? What can we do? I mean, um, he's lost two commissions and feeling pretty frustrated. And was any of that his fault? Absolutely not. Um, so what can he do? We can't do a darn thing. Um, and, you know, it was sad for me to say, we can't do it. And he said, well, you need to figure a way to fix it. And, uh, you know, there's pressure that's put on title companies all the time. I don't, I don't know um, what I can actually do to fix it. Just a second here. I'm trying to, I totally blown it. Oh, are you seeing that screen? Um, well, oh, share screen. There we go. So uh, a couple of things, and I don't want to dwell on these too much, but I think they're of um, value to look at here. Um, so, and, I, and I'll come back to, I think we found a fix for it, which is, I, I think, really, really good. Um, can you see that, yeah. Scott? Um, all right, so um, I just want to talk about secure. Are all of these emails secure? Gmail, Outlook, any other one that you can dream of? Um, even if you use two-factor authentication and you're not smart about it, it's not secure. Um, Email is a big problem. And um, one, one of the frustrations I have is almost every company has secure email, but it's a pain and people just don't want to use it. So if we could get over that and figure a way to make email secure without any kind of a hassle on our part, that would be fantastic. I think that would cut out a lot of fraud, but I don't see that happening because it's, um, Email is built on a platform that is not secure and they've tried to do fixes to it. If people aren't doing two-factor authentication and if they're not smart enough to say, oh, somebody just logged in, I won't, I won't accept them to my account or you know, something basic like that and you just allow people into your account, then um, you're gonna have a problem. Um, Kevin? Faxes, yeah. Um, what about changing your passwords, you know, right a week before or whatever the wire, you know, goes through? I think that's a good practice. I think it's a good practice to change your password constantly, but but I don't. <laughs> um, so I would imagine, I mean, is anybody in this class changing their passwords every week? Nobody, nobody does because it's hard to remember them. And if you have your password, I, I mean, one of the first, we have a password policy here at Title I and I guarantee I can walk to almost any escrow officer's desk 
open their front drawer and see their passwords all listed there. So we've even gone to a, um, a password um, vault. It's, a, it's an online vault and um, it's hard to get people to use that too. And so part of this is not, hey, I, I, it, it's harping on agents, it's harping on the whole community of real estate. It's hard because we're busy and we're, you know, an escrow officer maybe has five minutes to fund a deal. They're rush, rush, rushing. They get an email. It's easy to just say, oh yeah, that looks right. And, um, and not really verify it, but um, faxes absolutely can be spoofed. Um, I could send you all a fax. And if we were in person, I'd show you from any number that I want to send it from. And you're going to think, oh, that's legit. Websites get spoofed all the time. And phones are even less secure. I can call you from any number and it looks like I'm your best friend or something. But so even, even if I'm calling to verify somebody on the phone, that's a problem too. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the title, Southern Utah title. Uh, they had a client in Cedar City that was driving down to St. George. They were buying a new home in St. George and they got a phone call um, the buyer got a phone call that said, um, let's see, it said, hey, this is so-and-so at Southern Utah Title. Uh, we have, if you want this deal to fund today, and there were emails going back and forth, and that's what they suppose all the information came from. They called them up and said, if you want this to fund today, you need to wire funds, stop in Cedar City, and wire funds so that when you get here, we can fund the transaction. That was about $150,000 they wired. And when they got to Cedar City or to St. George, said, did you get my funds? And they said, what funds? We never called you. And so stuff like this is going on. And if it doesn't impact you, and if it hasn't impacted you, then, you know, it's easy to say, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. But um, I think the main part is if you're, if your client is in that transaction, I, I think they're going to blame the title company, right? I, but are they going to use you as an agent in the future? I, I, they're going to be irritated that they lost $150,000 and they're going to be so frustrated with the whole process. I doubt it if they're going to use anybody in that involved in that transaction anymore. I guess that leads us to the... Um, Next ex exciting factor here. Um, oh, your first keyword is silver. Okay. So, um, duty of care. Let me just read this. A duty of care is a legal obligation which is imposed on an individual requiring adherence to a standard of reasonable care while performing any acts that could foreseeably harm others. Um, it's the first element that must be established to proceed with an action of negligence. So um, I understand fully the responsibility of duty to care of a title company way more after these two experiences. And, and we've had a couple that were almost fraud, but we caught it. Um, and, and it's every day it's a battle. But what is your duty of care as a real estate agent? I, I would say number one, your duty of care is to inform and educate your buyers and sellers. Um, if you don't tell them that, you know, I, I mean, it's a fine line because you don't want them panicked. But then again, you want them to take this seriously and say, look, you're going to be wiring funds to the title company. Work with your title company and make sure that you understand exactly what their procedures are so that you can inform your client, hey, they will only accept wiring instructions in person or through a certain platform. And, and if anybody calls you for any other reason, 
you call me or you ignore it or you do whatever. And, um, and if you don't do that, you're, you can be negligent. Um, so going back to the Southern Utah title one, who do you think got sued in that, um, in that just the title company? in that $150,000 loss. Everyone. Everybody involved in the transaction was brought into litigation. And I'll tell you, just because I've been sued enough um, for very frivolous kind of uh, crazy things, the reason that title companies are generally pulled in is because it costs no more money to add another client who will maybe pay you some kind of settlement. And um, as agents, um, there's getting there's a lot of litigation that is um, um, a lot of litigation has happened in the last three years with wire fraud, and uh, and real estate agents are getting pulled into it, whether whether you're not involved or not. So you need to be informed. You need to make sure that proper procedures are being. Um, taken to protect your clients' money. So educate customers. That's number one. Um, and I think we've covered. Uh, I think we've covered that. Um, explain how to safely transfer money. You've got to. You've got to be very clear with your clients on that. And it, it's not only the buyers, it's the sellers, you know, uh, are the sellers going to pick up a check or the sellers going to receive um, funds by, by wire? I mean, most people are looking at wires now. I, I got so nervous for a while. I thought, wow, I don't even want to wire anymore. And, and, you know, just as a numbers game, I think we're sending somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 600 wires a month right now. That makes me almost not want to sleep at night because of the um, what? What are the chances that that all 600 of those are safe and done 100% protected? I used to worry uh, when I first started Title One years ago. I, I worried about claims. You know, what could happen if we did the title wrong or something like that? Claims are not even a concern. I mean, they're a concern. Okay, but. But that's not what gets me excited. It's um, it's these wires. How do you protect and make sure that we are um, protecting the agents, protecting um, the lenders, protecting the buyers and the sellers, and keeping the um, billions of dollars that are being lost every year out of the hands of and, and generally it's it's out of um, uh, Africa. Russia and um, China, and I'm not being racist or anything. It's just they they have economies that are just churning on this fraud, and uh, and and anyway, so you have to make sure that those instructions. I mean, you're going to have to um, you're going to have to really work with your title company to make sure that you understand their system, and then. Um, Je uh, Kevin, this is what it, yeah. So a lot of times, title companies like this is spring break, um, and the lady that I was working with had an assistant, and sometimes they have an assistant to an assistant. So I think it's good for us to communicate and ask them who's going to actually be contacting my client. Is it going to be, you know, so I can tell my client the name of the person? Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. Um, and, and title companies need to have better procedures in place so that you know when they're going to contact them and, um, and, uh, and, and just a way to verify. And, and I'll cover some of that that might help in the future here in just a minute. Um, also protect um, personally identifiable information. You guys have a lot of, um, I mean, maybe not as much as a lender or a title company does, but um, we're very concerned about our information. And some of the stuff I see just emailed in non-secure ways. 
makes me fearful. So uh, that's kind of a warning, but this is this is a part of a lot of litigation going on right now. And the more information you put out on your client through an email that a fraudster may have access to gives them more information to verify that they are that person. And so, so if you're involved in, in giving that, that um, personal information out, you're also a party to litigation. That's another thing that has been happening. And, um, and even though you don't have a contract with them to protect their personal information, you have a contract as your role as a real estate agent. If you're a party to them um, losing money to fraud, you do, all the cases show that um, you do have a responsibility um, and most likely you would get sued, you'd get pulled into a lawsuit if uh, that kind of loss happened. And then understand the standard of care. You're a professional and um, you will be held responsible. So those are kind of some uh, sad things to discuss, right? But um, here's, a, here's kind of going into this. Um, after this uh, second fraudulent attack, we, we had no, we had no liability in that. I mean, I guess we could have got sued on the $15,000 that was stolen, but um, our concern there is as this broker agent called me and said, Kevin, what can you do to fix this? Well, I can't do anything to fix it. I started looking and saying, okay, so so can we fix the process? Can we do something that, um, that makes things safe? I mean, who we're really concerned about are the buyers and the sellers. We're not concerned about wires that we're sending to lenders for payoffs. I mean, to a degree, but you know, we send Wells Fargo payoffs every week. We know what their wire information is. It's, it's the buyer and the seller that we really don't know. And, and so, and, and generally we've never sent a wire to them before. So how do, we, how do we fix that? How do we make it so that it's safe? And I found this um, certified ID. And, um, and, you know, I told you, this is the biggest concern that I have um, as an owner of a title company is how do we how do we, I, and you know, I care about the good of the community, but I also care about myself. How do I avoid $67,000 losses every year? How do I avoid just the bad press of, oh, I closed with Title I and somebody stole my money? It may have been on a split, but nonetheless, it's, it, it reflects poorly on us. And, and so we found this certified ID, certify ID, um, it's a, um, it's been around for a little while. I, I'm going to have Scott talk about it for a minute, but um, what it really does is it's a, it's a portal that, so there's two parts to it. There's a portal that the, um, the buyer can log into and, and, and it's, it, you know, it costs title one, $5,000 a year to have that portal available to our clients. So it's not cheap, but it sure is cheaper than a bad reputation and $67,000 loss, or even a $15,000 loss. You know, I, I think as an industry, we've got to find ways to make ourselves, to make sure, I think as an agent, you need to make sure that none of your clients ever have this kind of a situation happen. And, and certified ID is not exclusive to Title I. I think we were the first ones to sign up in Utah, and I don't know how many others they have signed up. It integrates with our title software. Um, so if we, the first point is a buyer. A buyer has to log into a portal and it gives them a, um, it asks them four questions. And, and this process takes three to four minutes. And quite honestly, from my point of view, I don't care if it takes them four minutes as long as we can save them the loss of money. Okay, and, and hopefully you feel that way, but I don't know if, if, you wanna, if you wanna take that, I don't know how to make it more simple. Four minutes to make sure that they 
don't lose their money in this transaction is a pretty good deal. I mean, it seems like a pretty good deal to me. So they log in and they put in four bits of information and through that portal in, and, and then they put in their, their um, they receive our wire instructions through that portal. Um, and all they have to do is take those wire instructions to the bank and wire directly to us. If something happens and that money is not, um, doesn't make it to us, I'm gonna just say that as a general and I'll have Scott address the other issue because they're stupid too. But if you, if you, um, if they send, if they follow the instructions that are give, given to them through the portal, go to their bank and send money to us, and it doesn't make it because of no fault on their own, um, that transaction is insured up to a million dollars through certified ID. Title I pays three bucks every time a wire comes into us or goes out from us on this certified ID platform. So we're paying to have Lloyds of London back us for up to a million dollars on each wire. Um, that makes me sleep at night because we have a, we have a uh, now a guarantee that that those funds are coming to us no matter what. It's an insurance policy backed by a portal, which is a you know a, a great option. And then you have the seller side of it where um, they have to log in if they're not actually here in the closing, physically giving us their wire instructions. They log into a portal, they put in, it, it verifies who they are. You know, it's kind of this uh, high tech, scary stuff where your information's out there, whether you like it or not, and they can verify your address, your age, everything. I'd say stay off social media if you don't want it all out there. But they, um, if we send a wire to their account, directly to their account, um, again, it's insured up to a million dollars. So in my mind, this really fixes um, a lot of the issues that we have. And I would encourage you to look for or, or ask from your title company, is there, do you have certified? I, I think there's a couple others. Certified is one of the biggest and they have some numbers here. As of the first of the year, they had, um, and, and Certified ID was spun off from a title company in Wisconsin who lost half a million dollars and they said no more. So they started this and it's been in the works for about five years. It's been functional for two, but they protected 150,000 wires. That's $30 billion in money transferred and zero claims on the insurance pretty good track record. Um, I know that it takes a couple extra steps, but boy, I can't, I can't, you know, I've been looking for a solution for a long time and this looks like a great solution. And I'm not, I don't have any interest in certified ID. I only have interest in, I'll, I'll bring up one other point. One of the frustrating things with this um, last transaction we had with the agent who came to me and said, what, you know, what can you do? I think one thing that you could do as an agent um, is to make sure, and maybe this is overstretching and you guys can tell me, no, you're crazy. That would never work. But your commission's on the line too, not to mention the buyer's money. And maybe you don't care about the buyer if you're on the seller side, but you do care about your sellers not being able to purchase that home, that next transaction that's tied to it. I think I would be questioning those agents, do you have protection against wire fraud? And, and maybe, you know, I, I might be a little overzealous on this, okay? But if there was protection on that deal where our agent comes to me and says, what can I do? That transaction would have flowed through, no problem. But instead, and, and he's darn lucky that it was only $15,000. What if it was $100,000? You're not gonna go gather $100,000 from your neighbors and friends to be able to pay for the 15,000 that you lost. That's gonna be a lot harder scenario. So um, even in the transactions, I would hope that this 
this platform or similar platforms are able to be um, uh, utilized more and required by, by agents so that uh, we're not giving away billions of dollars every year, every year in money. And I think Scott has some stuff to say on that. Scott, if you want to turn your thought on something. Yeah. <clears throat> well, hopefully you hear me. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, there's also... There's also a, a second uh, key word that you should have here, which is dollar, D-O-L-L-A-R. Okay, so let me talk a little bit, let me give you a little bit about my background and, and, and then talk a little bit about this funds transfer. And then I had some questions myself in regards to how you uh, make sure that your client is taken care of. Now, my background, I spent five years as an insurance agent and I can tell you that regardless of whether it's your fault or not, your client sees you as their representative. So, you know, they don't know the title company. They don't know the lenders that well. They do know who the real estate agent is. And when I was in insurance uh, and ran my own business, I, the buck always came back to me whether it was my fault or not. And I can tell you Regardless of whether I was really responsible for the loss of, of my client's money or coverages that weren't proper or in place, it never felt good. And so even if in my own mind, I would say to myself, this is not my problem, this is not my fault, I would still not feel, um, <laughs> I would not sleep well at night. Repeat the second question. That second password again is dollar, like a dollar bill. Okay, so, so even though, and you have E&O coverage and I had E&O coverage also, and I never actually ended up having to use the E&O coverage, but I will tell you that there were a few times that when I left my office, I, I didn't feel very good because the client is a consumer. And a lot of times the consumers don't know anything. So they're, they're depending upon a professional who's going to be able to guide them through the labyrinth of, of the transaction of whatever happens to be going on. So when it comes to this in regards to uh, wire fraud um, and, and Certified ID made this kind of presentation about protecting the client, I had a big question for them and I called them and I spent about 45 minutes to an hour with them talking over this scenario. I said to him, you guarantee that that transaction will be insured and that the risk is going to come on to Lloyds of London or whoever may be the underwriter on this. But what happens if, your, if the client doesn't follow instructions? In other words, here's the instruction, go into the portal and do take these few minutes of step. But what happens if they don't do that? And then they end up having their funds, um, losing their funds. So the answer to that is this. There is a separate coverage that can be purchased by the consumer. And the charge is $3 per thousand of their money. So let's say a person has $100,000 that they're <coughs> wanting to wire transfer. They can insure it for three for $300. And now somebody may say, well, I don't want to pay the $300. That's great. But all insurance is about is risk transfer. But what would be nice for the agent to be able to say so that they can now talk with their customer is say, here's an option. You can insure your money no matter what happens. You can insure your money through certified ID for $3 per thousand and if somehow something goes wrong, even if the consumer is the one that did something wrong, uh, certified ID is actually insuring that transaction. So most people uh, may say, uh, I don't wanna pay that money because the chance of loss is very um, low. And it probably is because if they follow the instructions, Kevin already stated here, what's the loss? Zero. For, for transactions to have a zero loss ratio is unheard of. So that must mean that, that going through that portal is working for your client. It's really protecting your client. 
But if your client doesn't do it right, there's no protection. In other words, you got to take one, two, three steps. It's going to take you three minutes. But if your client doesn't do that, what happens now? Well, they can purchase that if, if they want. So that's an added benefit. If I were a real estate agent and I was talking to my client, I would explain that and say, look, here's the other option. If you feel like you need this coverage, great. If you don't, great. But at least now you've explained it, which gets back to a lot of times what would happen to me uh, as an insurance agent. People would assume they have different kinds of coverages, but in the end, sometimes they didn't. Like if they built a barn in the back and they don't let their insurance company know and it burns down, do they have coverage? The answer is no, but they think they do. For some reason, they don't think they need to call their insurance agent. And so even though you're in the right, still it doesn't have, that conversation is not a very pleasant conversation. So in my mind, being a, an insurance guy my whole life, this is the kind of protection that you want to be able to explain to your clients so that if something does happen, that you're able to actually say, well, we talked about this, you decided this is something you didn't want to do. And so that's why it's not done. The other, of course, the other part of this is that um, there's absolutely no cost to going through um, certified ID for your client if they follow the steps. It's all that's borne by the title company. So is there any questions anybody has on that uh, that before I turn the time back over uh, to Kevin here for the final few thoughts? Anybody have any thoughts? Okay, great. Kevin, I'll turn it back over to you. As I was muted, am I muted? Can you hear me? Okay. So, you know, I, I mean, this almost sounds a little more like, uh, I, what I would do is I would, um, I, I think this gives you information. Number one, make sure you have two-factor authentication on your email. Make sure you're not sending private information unsecure. You, you shouldn't be doing that. There are ways to send it secure, even through Gmail. Um, and, then, and then I would I would reach out to the title company you're working with and they will sign anybody. Certified ID is an open platform. Um, I would say your business is worth 5,000 a year you know, to a, uh, to a title company and maybe $3 a file or if it's through Stuart title, it's $3. If it's through any other title company, it's seven bucks a, a wire for us. But for me, the risk factor is worth it to, um, it doesn't mean that I, I can't, you know, that I can just email anything I want. You've, you've still got to have all those policies and procedures in place. And, um, we spent a lot of money on, um, security, uh, not only for the paper files, but for the, um, for the um, um, digital files. A lot of money is spent on that, but the one point of weakness is this, this transfer of money. And um, Certified ID fixes that. We've now sent, um, I think in January, we sent somewhere around 60 files and we're up to 200 a month. I, I think we'll stay right around 200 because we're not using certified ID for um, the lender transfers back and forth. Um, most, it works best for personal information. So, uh, I mean, for an individual, not for a corporation. So I would just, I'd have you reach out and, um, you can look up Certified ID's website. There's a, um, get your title companies in touch with them. I mean, to me, I thought, oh, this is a great, this is a great idea, but if Title One's the only one using it, I know we're not the only one nationally, and I think Stuart Title, um, the corporation is rolling it out to all of their agents, uh, not their agents, their direct operations. Um, uh, they're working with several underwriters, so I would in, I would insist on that. Have your have your buyers and sellers protected. It's it's kind of the next step. If if 
if we had no wire fraud anymore, boy, life would be great. So anyway, I, you know, that's really all I have. If you guys have any questions on it or anything, anything we've talked about, um, I'm happy to answer any of those questions, but if not, Third keyword. Oh, third keyword. Third keyword. Man. Is what? Man. Man. Like Scott is the man. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Scott and Kevin. We appreciate you guys uh, joining us for this uh, one hour C. Um, Chelsea is going to put that link in the chat here. If she can hear me. Hi, sorry, I'm here. Okay, we put that link to the Google Docs for the keywords in the chat. Please. Yes, I will put it in the chat right now for everyone. So go ahead and fill that out. Make sure you fill it out correctly. And then uh, send that in to us and we'll get that sent off. So man is the last word. Scott is the man, the silver dollar man. And then... <laughs> Okay, um, if that's it, we appreciate you guys being here for our free CE hour and uh, be sure to check out our calendar. We have like seven hours next week that we're putting out. So uh, join us uh, next week. Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks you. Again, Thanks for having us. Thanks, bye. Hello? Oh, there we go. Where did it go? Can anyone hear me?